Today we are in conversation with a serial entrepreneur and someone who heads up a division called Everything at one of the world's most uh, valuable privately held companies. We are in conversation with Jason Drogi. Uh, you're in Delhi. Yep. And thank you very much for joining us here. Yeah. Uh, so, Jason, let's begin by talking about Uber Everything. Sure. Uh, right? What does Uber Everything stand for? What was the premise for which uh, Travis Kalanick brought you in in 2014 to head this up? And just for our viewers to give you a little bit of a background, uh, Travis Kalanick, founder of Uber, and Jason actually worked together on Jason's first startup way back uh, in the late 1990s. Uber, I think, always had a bit of a, a vision that software could change how we interact with the physical world and could make cities better. Um, and moving, you know, you know, sort of personal transportation is part of that. Um, but there was a vision that maybe that technology and that sort of logistics network could actually take a step further and, and, and do other things. But the company wasn't sure what those things were. Uh, and so we came in and my first uh, you know, title was head of special projects, which right. sort of reflected the ambiguity of the role. Um, and my job was to come in and sort of look at the space and figure out which, which industries were interesting and still on vision for Uber in terms of you know, um, celebrating the city that you live in and connecting you with the things that um, you really want to do. Um, you know, and as we did a bunch of experiments uh, over the course of that year, because we really didn't know, and as with entrepreneurship, right. you have to try things, tweak, there's yeah. a lot of failure in, in early days, but you get customer signals. And so food became one of the sort of most interesting signals that we got. So why Uber Eats? It began in 2014 in LA as a small experiment. It was called Uber Fresh then. Mm -hmm. uh, but the real, uh, I think, achievement was uh, 2015 in Toronto cracking that market mm -hmm. and then expanding now you guys are in over 100 cities 108 cities around the world uh, including six in India so tell us about uh, Uber Eats why get into the food delivery market it's already a competitive space so when you launched uh, that in North America you already had the likes of Grubhub you already had the likes of Postmates and so many others doing similar work so why Eats why food delivery yeah so I think food delivery, so if, if you look at the delivery space up until the point um, we started to enter it, um, uh, you know, a lot of delivery was done by restaurants themselves. Um, and there weren't as many uh, people doing deliveries uh, on behalf of a restaurant. And so if you look at what Uber is really good at, is it's good at moving things from A to B. We were moving people from A to B, and now we can move products from A to B. And so the question was, what is that product? Um, and food is perishable. Restaurants are scattered throughout a city. So from a, from a pragmatic standpoint, um, uh, Uber's logistics network and logistics technology, uh, uh, we've been investing in for years and we could leverage that. Um, and the delivery network that Uber was providing allows those restaurants to plug into uh, sort of enterprise world-class infrastructure to interact with anyone. So, you know, in a world where you have chains and mid-sized restaurants and independents, they all can plug into the same sort of powerful Uber delivery network. Uh, so out of the 108 markets that you're in, uh, 27 of those uh report suggests that you're already profitable in? Since that 108 number, yeah. which, which was actually July of this year, yes. we've gone from 108 to 180 okay. um, in just the past few months. Um, and so we're expanding pretty quickly. Um, so that 27 out of 108 that were profitable, that means that the city is operating and paying all of its, its, its expenses, um, uh, including headcount and all okay. of the costs of running a city and generating a profit. Okay. And, uh, Talking about margins here, so McKenzie study actually put down that uh, you know the aggregators earn about 40 to 50 percent on margins. Uh, the newer delivery players like Deliveroo or even Swiggy is at about 30 percent. Where is Uber Eats? Where does where where do the margins fall for a company like Uber Eats? Yeah, I I think it's too early to even talk about like those. So why is it too early? I mean, when is it not? And I want to put this in the context of uh, Uber rides as well, right? When is it? not going to be too early to talk about profitability? When is it not going to be too early to talk about burn rates and so on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's, and that's why we do talk about those 27 cities. Right. Um, to put it in perspective, our two-year anniversary is this December of the Uber Eats like app. Um, and so uh, uh, 
having 27 markets out of 108 in July of this year uh, be profitable, we think is really good progress on the unit economics of the business, on the viability of the business. Um, and so to speak to specific margins, that's that's more what I meant on it being a bit early to like dial okay. in the exact number. Okay. Of course, you know, we should be building viable businesses. We should be talking about margins. And that's the reason why we released that number, because we wanted to show that there is a real business here. All right. And is this a surprise that the new Uber CEO, Dara Kushra Sai, is actually talking about? So uh, reports suggest, I think, a New York Times article that said that uh, he called Uber Eats a wonderful surprise. Is this the surprise that, you know, there's a part of the Uber business that's thriving in that sense? I think and it's an, it's an early business. It's yeah. a new business. Yeah, yeah. I think, well, well, well first, I, like, I was... I was uh, delightfully, uh, you know, surprised and happy that you know he he took the time to recognize us publicly. Um, I think that I think that the surprise was more around we haven't really talked about the business. Um, it's not that it was surprising that the business was profitable or successful. It's just that we've been so heads down on building the business, we haven't done many of these, you know, All right. interviews or we haven't okay. discussed that publicly about it. So I think that was more the surprise side. And then I think the wonderful side is, you know, we have a, um, a number of profitable markets. They're growing quickly. We're investing in awesome markets like India. Um, and so I think that was more the context of what he meant. Uh, how do you read uh, the competition here? So we have Zomato and we have Swiggy, two of the largest players. And all of these players are now set setting up virtual kitchens, uh, right, to serve the market better, to serve this millennial better. Uh, tell us about where the virtual kitchens business for Uber Eats stands, sure. how you're building that out uh, in other markets, what you're looking at in India, and how do you read uh, what Zomato and Swiggy are doing? Yeah. So, um, uh, so let's just talk about sort of the restaurant business. Right quickly. So restaurants um, that have invested in the infrastructure that they have um, want as many orders as possible going into their restaurants because they've made a fixed investment. Um, and so we've taken a, a slightly different approach, which is um, we've actually provided data to restaurants so that they can do one of a couple things. Um, data in the form of feedback from their cust you know, from uh, the customers that order delivery through Eats about you know, whether or not they like uh, a meal, um, but also data on what's popular in their area, what do we think would be popular in the area, so they could actually launch a separate brand even in the same restaurant, you know, only available for delivery on Uber Eats. Uh, and so we're, use, we're taking sort of a tech and data approach um, to better utilizing those restaurants. We see a lot of restaurants uh, you know, in the U.S. where we've uh, sort of leaned the most into this experimentation, but it'll come here um, soon, is uh, that there's already a lot of spare space within existing kitchens. And so why build you know, more kitchens as a first step whenever we can make better use of, you know, or restaurants can make better use of the space that they already have. Okay, now let's talk about everything else at Uber. What is, uh, apart from Uber Eats, what else uh, is the everything that you and your team are working on? Sure. So, so we're constantly experimenting with other ideas. Um, we have a product called Uber Rush, which is using Uber's platform. Uh, it's, it, it's sort of a logistics platform as a way to deliver for third parties. And we're working some, with some third parties in uh, the United States um, you know, on some experiments there. Um, and then we have um, a number of other businesses that are better earlier stage, like how does Uber interact with uh, business customers and use uh, you know, Uber's you know, consumer products and technology, but then service all of the needs that a business might have to use rides or delivery, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, and then beyond that, it's just a long list of ideas and experimentation that hopefully we'll be able to share with you at some point. And uh, autonomous cars, and what is that going to do for Uber Eats, if at all? I, I wouldn't even want to speculate on that. Like, uh, we're heads down focusing on solving problems for our restaurants and our eaters. All right. Okay. And you don't think uh, what we're seeing with driverless cars, in, just in terms of just the food delivery business and how it's going to tie in uh, with your larger mission of making logistics invisible? Yeah, I think I, you know, it's a very exciting future we're going into. Um, my team doesn't doesn't necessarily focus on a lot of the autonomy. I think that when it comes, you'll have lower costs, you'll have easier access. Um, I think it'll be a continuation. But again, it's it's like, uh, you know, technology should be in service of customer problems um, and lower cost uh, access to everything. And I think autonomy is just a potential solution to that over time. All right, great. Thank you, Jason, for joining us on Young Turks. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, thanks a lot great, for watching. You. And uh, stay tuned to CNBC for a lot more news and updates.